Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, depending on where you're at today. Thank you for joining our Dane Protects How to Avoid Destroying Your Electric Vehicle, a comprehensive approach for lightning protection for charging stations. This is a an interactive seminar, so uh, we we invite the experts within our audience to contribute their voice of experience and voice of experts so that we can help drive the, the art of protection forward. So welcome to our session. I'd like to introduce myself, Mark Hendricks, and my colleague, Stephen Weber. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Stephen will be coordinating the back office side of our webinar series and we'd like to make sure that the audience knows that the session is eligible for a uh, one hour continuing education credits under these uh, professional engineer registrations a quick introduction dane 111 years doing this lightning protection and electrical protection uh what we what we really intend to show is how the lightning affects your systems and then apply the pillars of protection which are the basic blocks that that together create a comprehensive solution for lightning protection and just a, a real quick note to the photo on the image here this is a lightning strike into a parking lot and you can see sort of nearby and behind it there are some tall structures power lines high tension lines and they didn't get struck. It didn't necessarily go to the big tall stuff nearby. Lightning goes where it wants to go. So that's just a reminder that that's, uh, that's the environment we live So lightning versus electric car. This is out there in YouTube world where you can, you can go take a look at this. And I invite you to look at second number eight in your free time. It shows that that uh, the driver's experience of what occurred so it's kind of an interesting way to look at the the world of lightning protection from the the victim and you know what we're trying to protect in many of these cases both the automobile the infrastructure it's it's about creating a safe environment for the charging both the equipment and the the charging the driver So I have a question to get our interactive polling session in motion. And this is, of course, what most people would ask first anyway. <clears throat> Am I safe in my car during a lightning storm? So uh, thank you, Stephen, pushing us to the, the, the question. Please take a moment to answer the audience polling portion of our session. This will get us uh, an indication of what people think. What do you think? The answer is for this question. How do you, as a driver of an electric car or any car, what do you think is the answer to this? So we'll give the audience a moment to participate and then Stephen will get us to a, a quorum and we'll kick over. Okay. We've got a quorum and half and half. Yeah, well, it's, that based on the photograph, Half of our audience thinks uh, that it's safe. And, uh, it's split down the middle. Interesting. Okay, well, we need a tiebreaker next time. So let me make sure everybody participates. So look at this photo. You can see this pickup truck getting what looks like, I think, used to be a pickup truck, is engulfed in a ball of plasma. So if you're in an enclosed metal roof and sides vehicle, it offers reasonable protection whether or not the vehicle still operated after this but it's the 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 uh the actual statistics show that you're reasonably safe and of course seek shelter indoors so in as much as both both answers are right and you'll see that we have a a penchant for asking questions like this but statistically you are safe inside your vehicle certainly safer than being just randomly out in the middle of the field behind the pickup truck so charging stations we're 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 really looking at uh, sort of the the around the world kind of look at this but this is 
this is a post that's uh, a, a charging pile that's actually won some design awards because it's you know it's not a stick in the mud sort of sort of look but the real point is is that you know we want to make sure that the the market space is properly employing protection techniques in this case the use of a of a spd to uh, protect the electrical power right at the point of use that's a really important piece to understand and you know what is required for safe operation uh in this set of photographs you, you actually don't see the there was right after this had been installed this is the the little switch box for that charge station but right after that was installed there was a small fence a security fence put around it that's that's a good measure of you know physical security but what is what is required for safe operation this is a a you know an in-depth look at the comprehensive measures that you would apply so have another polling question for our for our team today i'd like to ask why you're here why are we here at this lightning protection webinar i'm looking for information i've suffered equipment losses i think i have a protection problem now i'm working on charging upgrades or improvements or i'm bored and this is an interesting topic so let's let's see what our audience thinks please take a moment to answer the polling question and get a feel for our audience participation Give everybody one more moment. Stephen, are we near? Yep, here we go. I'm looking for information. Well, very good because Dane wants to be the uh, go-to source for, for information. In fact, we have many resources on this and other topics and in, uh, very happy to engage with our customer base. So let's move forward here. Our Next polling question, just want to get a little bit more about our audience. Are you from a manufacturer? Are you an installer of equipment, a site owner, the, you know, associated with something like here, like a photograph that we were illustrating at a parking lot? Are you in the engineering side doing project, project consultant? Or are you in some sort of fleet deployment that is important for you? So, uh, I'd like to understand what segment your viewpoint would come from. And we'll give everybody a moment. Thank you for taking the time to do this. It helps it helps us be more engaging. Uh, a lot of a lot of engineering consultant type uh, audience. Um, great to see the manufacturers of the equipment because you know we want to we want to help participate in having the best customer experience so that's that gives us a chance to help you make your best customer experience so anyway this is really interesting to see the the mix of audience thank you for that so we want to understand your viewpoint to help address your concerns in best ways so dane ascribes to of course nfpa methods as well as the iec 62305 Global protection methods, our, our products are geared towards that set of standards. And there's a, a set of advantages that I like to bring forward with the use of the, the IEC methods is that it gives you a really good step-by-step, -step, I, I call it a, a walkthrough or you can call it end-to-end -end or maybe the journey, but it gets you from the risk analysis of what I have to deal with to, to actually cover a safe operating environment, uh, it, you know, for worker safety and health and for user safety. And it guides you through the requirements, walks you through the methods of, to, to apply spacing, down conductors and earthing, uh, vertical earthing buried rods. And it introduces the measures to produce touch step voltage. And, gives you the application guidelines for SPDs, and it helps you control the risk. And that's that's really what we're trying to, to do with lightning protection, is to control the risk. So why is this important? We have residential fire safety, you have the charge piles that might be at a home, you have personal safety at commercial sites, your users are drivers, they're, they're charging outdoors, they're exposed. You have asset protection, of course, 100% equipment operation time. The, the 
the users are coming to your charge stations for a reason to get a, 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 a vehicle charged, that's a sort of a high imperative issue to be, you know, to safely operate their vehicle. Uh, are, this is important to get master label application for these structures for, for something like a UL master label. And it's important to, to get a fundamental maintenance and inspection system in place to guarantee the long-term safety of your asset. It's not, it's, you know, lightning protection measures are very robust, but like anything else, they do need to be inspected and maintained. So the IC methods give you a really good end-to-end -end journey of this type of requirement. I have another opportunity for an question, an interactive question. So what functional area of a charging station must be protected? At the main incoming line, after backup generators or transfer switches, is it right at the charging apparatus? that you have to protect from ground potential rise, or sometimes it could be at the coffee vending machine because you may be at a slow, to what, what we call them type one charging stations that may require you know, as much as 45 minutes to get 25 miles of, of range. So the coffee machine could actually be very important. So let's uh, take a moment for interactive ideas. And the polling results show right at the main incoming feet. That's, um, that is, the, of course, the, the, the very logical spot. And then we've also seen it in some of our previous photographs that you put the, char the, the protection right at the charging apparatus. I call that the point of use. And that gives you the best, the best control of risk and voltage control and surge voltage and surge current control right at that charge pile before it enters the customer's car so that you don't cause damage to that customer's vehicle. So that's excellent to see the feedback from the, from the audience on that. Thank you. Well, let's, let's walk through the risk at a charging station. Well, let's talk about that. So you have direct strike. You have the, the risk that this just directly strikes your vehicle or the charging pile. Uh, you have the, the risk of what are considered indirect strikes, where it hits something nearby and introduces that, that, that ground swell. You see it in the, in, in the illustration, it's sort of a, a wave of voltage that would be induced across the soil. And the other, the other important surge is, the, it's the electrical surge that's induced from this. So the, either a voltage rise induces a surge or a surge current is electromagnetically induced. But the point is it's a surge, voltage and or current. And just as a reference point, these are the industry standard indications of what, what the direct strikes look like. The, the 10 by 350 is a very commonly referenced waveform from the IEC methods. It's also a very close approximation for what are considered the Department of Transportation that uh, that you see in such standards for aircraft and for military standards for the, the definition of a lightning direct strike. So 10 by 350 gives you a reasonable commercial equivalent to the prevailing MIL standards and Department of Transportation standards for such direct strike risk. Okay, so these are the basic waveform definitions. We're not going to go too far into the details, but suffice to say there's differences. And this is a really important aspect for the charge station environment where something nearby gets struck and it induces touch step voltage across the ground. And you see the increments of 30 meters. What what that's in what that's implying is that there is a volt per meter rise across the ground, and when you're standing in that vicinity, you're feeling that relative to everything around you. It's not bird on a wire type voltage steps. These are this is the opposite of bird on a wire. This is where it actually is. You feel the little bit of difference from the particle next to you, and so and in the, the 
estimations of what what can actually be incurred is you can see these huge voltage rises and this is the voltage you would feel across your feet so you know this is why it's so imperative to pay attention to touch step to make that as close to zero as possible that's what equipotential bonding would achieve so this is a really big aspect that we'll also see in our slides so we take a few moments to still talk about the actual formation and discharge of lightning. This is a nice illustration that we free, freeze in motion and, and it's showing the, the major aspects. You have that direct strike, but you also have small step leaders that are developing and trying to attach to the main channel. And what's important is this, this is still considered a lightning surge into the, to the upper portion of that building, even though it wasn't the main channel. And we have a few photographs that really make a good example. This was, I, I call it the lightning versus sycamore, but I first saw this in National Geographic. And it's a very convincing argument why you don't stand under trees. And that half a million volts across your feet that are experienced right there next to the base of that tree. But notice the small tendrils that are attaching to the, the the antenna next to the structure and even in the trees in the dis distance. That's a, an, an exact photograph of the step leaders that didn't attach, but still caused a small amount of lightning and induced damage. And this is the premise that, that uh, we talk about that step leader attachment distance. So this is what is considered the, the basis of how lightning would jump at the very last moment before it makes a channel. It jumps through the air, the, the, the step leader, the upward step leader or downward, you know, a lot of flavors of lightning, but this is the final jump. And what's understood is that it, the smaller the lightning bolt, not all the same in the zoo, who's who in the zoo of lightning, a smaller lightning bolt jumps a smaller distance, okay? Makes approximate, makes sense sort of, med because what's happening is the charge builds up and it creates an electric field and it provokes a step leader. A larger charge provokes a longer step leader, okay? And that's what wants to finally cause dielectric breakdown and become the charge, uh, the attachment point. So I take a moment to introduce the next polling question. What does that sphere represent? That's that rolling sphere, the, the electric field. Is that the theoretical attachment point? Is it the step leader, the distance a step leader can, dump, can jump? Is it the coverage calculation over a structure? The rolling sphere, what does that represent? So a bit of a trick question, give you a moment to, to look, to, to read all the answers and make your best judgment. This is a good opportunity for the, the voice of experience and voice of experts to help us understand the, the market space. So what does the rolling sphere represent? We got the coverage calculation over a structure. That's sort of the, the most popular answer, theoretical attachment point for a step leader. Exactly. Actually, all of them are sort of the right answer, and and that you'll you'll see that I like I like that sort of makes you think about it and pick what you think is the best answer. So it's interesting to see the customer the the voice of expert feedback. So it's actually somewhat like the, like all of them, and we'll see a few nice illustrations of this. So looking at the IEC methods, they give you a good guidance from. From end to end, you, you get good guidance on doing risk analysis, grounding, design, touch step potential control. You get good, in, good uh, guidance on the actual external lightning protection design. So Dane has a set of tools. These are also industry available that you can, you can evaluate the risk and look at the, the risk at a charging station. It might be a small structure, but you'll find that you have a high risk of, of damage or safety risk. And what the risk analysis allows you to do is to set a severity level that you think is tolerable. That's generally the industry standard 
severity level, which is shown in blue. And if you don't do anything, you have a risk that exceeds the threshold for human life safety, for instance. That what the what the risk analysis allows you to do is pick more or less stringent methods to control your risk based on your tolerance. So if if you want something like uh, a mission critical NASA spaceship, you have zero tolerance for risk. You will select something like class LP lightning protection level one, which is assuming the smallest lightning bolt radius which will and the most stringent grounding methods if you can tolerate a little more risk you might select lpl3 which is a larger rolling sphere radius and slightly less stringent earthing measures and so what it allows you to do is fine tune for your application which is a really important part for the charging station infrastructure so we talked about the, the the amount of LPL protection level you have to apply. Well, it roughly it it, it lays out essentially as a risk of the low volt, the low current lightning bolt. So in the world of measurements of lightning, it's found that a, a very small lightning bolt is about three kA, and it's it you've captured almost every lightning bolt in the low range possible. 99% of the small lightning is, is, in, is accounted for. And this is, think of it this way, lightning takes a lot of energy to build up in the atmosphere. There's sort of a minimum amount of lightning it takes, voltage, charge, that it takes to build up to actually punch through a mile of air, right? So there's, there is sort of a bottom range. And what, what we find is that when uh, people such as uh, Dr. Martin do research where they're launching rockets up into the air, it's artificial lightning might be a smaller species because you've you've let it cheat. But bear in mind the the what's considered the class three, which is uh, very equivalent to the NFPA um, standards for lightning as well, is considered a 10 kA lightning bolt in which case you've accounted for 91% of the low event. So there can be smaller lightning strikes, and that's why they get into the nooks and crannies. And then ultimately you may choose that you have a very low risk and you can accommodate a very large rolling sphere, and that's acceptable for many applications with, as well. So the whole principle of lightning protection falls upon what we like to call it, the pillars, but it's based on very much the conventional lightning system that Ben Franklin developed in 1752. We released it to public domain, put up an air terminal, have a down conductor, and get it into the soil, into an earth termination system, the, the grounding rods. But also maintain separation distance. And if you can't stay away from something like a the rebar in your concrete, you must bond it, which is equipotential bonding to reduce the touch step voltage effects. And in an ideal world, everything is equipotential bonded together and you have no risk of flash to anything because everything is bonded. But things like electrical circuits have uh, electrical wires, you can't bond them. And things like radio antennas, you don't want to bond to your lightning protection system. And there's also many times that you've got something like your charge pile, you don't want bonded to the lightning rod. So the bits of metal are either bonded or they're separate. And that's the principles of lightning. So we wanna follow through that. So how does lightning induce surges? This is an interesting chicken and the egg conversation. How does lightning induce surges? Is it a direct coupling of the strike delivered into the wire? Is it electromagnetic induced current into a wire? Or is it the ground potential rise that provokes a, a line to ground voltage? How do, what is it doing when it delivers this surge? And a lot of times it's the chicken and the egg discussion. There's, there's Tremendous theory on, you know, propagation of electromagnetic waves through free space. 
So what does our audience have today? What, what's the, what are you worried about? A, a good mixture, but a lot, of, a lot of concern about ground potential rise. For the charging station, that's actually a really good thing to be concerned about because that's the touch step voltage risk of a, of a user of a charge pile as they're standing around their vehicle waiting you know, for, for their charge uh, to, to complete. So this is actually an interesting you know, point and why it's so critical to be concerned about in this industry. So isolation, we talked about, we talked about isolating a system. And I use NASA as a good example because they are pretty concerned about lightning down here in, in Cape Canaveral. Uh, SpaceX, these these towers that you see around the launch platform are essentially a isolated system to give the lightning a preferred attachment point rather than the rocket full of liquid oxygen and hydrazine. So this is the essence of a light of an isolated lightning protection system. This is diverting the lightning away from the the sensitive victim that you don't want to experience any lightning disruption. So isolated lightning protection prevents what? Isolated lightning protection, what, what would that prevent? So side flash from down conductors into adjacent structures, ground potential rise into the master ground bar, ignition sources caused by sparks from unbonded metal. So what does that isolated system do for you? And we'll give the audience a moment to read through our tricky questions. A lot, of, lot to read, so I'll give you another moment. And we're getting a consensus side flash. And that's fundamentally it, it, the major purpose is to prevent side flash. And it can be used to prevent ground potential rise because you can divert the lightning into the soil many meters, tens of meters away from your earth rod that's giving you a master ground bar. And it prevents ignition sources caused by sparks from unbonded metal because it's not flashing. So depending on what you're, you're trying to do, it can achieve these results. So that's a great, Great indication of, of the understanding of this. Thank you. So a practical example in a charging station, we've got uh, high voltage isolated lightning protection rods around the shelter canopy at some charging stations. And it's achieving exactly what we want, a reduced touch step voltage risk around the charge pile, because you're not bonding everything together. You're isolating the lightning away from your metal. And it reduces the surge effects into that charge pile and the vehicle. So it it this type of system can very, very effectively create a, a, an extremely safe environment. This has probably got solar panels on the top of it. So you're protecting a reasonably you know complex asset. And more importantly, this th these these types of these types of sites are intended to be extremely self-reliant. So you don't want to come out here every day and have to do a maintenance call to reset CPUs or replace, you know, batteries and, you know, weird things like that. So we have another inactive polling question. We're moving right along. This is external lightning protection is not required on my system. External LPS, lightning protection system, is not required the, because it attracts lightning to my charger. It's too expensive. I already have a surge protector on my AC power. The LPS is not in my specification. Or maybe the contrary, the LPS actually is in my specification. So that's our, that we're, we're trying to, again, get a feel for the audience experience. What are the arguments before or against? So we have a moment and we'll give the audience a moment to get a consensus. And it looks like 
there is a good understanding and requirement. Thank you. That's that's reassuring because when I see you know applications that that do not require conventional lightning protection, I I sometimes cringe. So thank you for that feedback. And you know, yeah, it's uh, it. Somebody might say that I have an SPD, which is good, but um, if we go back to our interactive polling question, I've got a few images from some sites here in Florida. And this is a, a site at a, at a parking lot at a, a, a market store. And you can see the charge pile is right up adjacent to a light pole. Nice they have a fire extinguisher. I really appreciate that. Um, but the point is, is that you've, you've got a, a lightning rod. Like, you got a big light pole right there. So if this gets struck by lightning, I can, I can promise you this light, this charge pole is feeling some effect of that. And most likely there needs, there, there needs to be an SPD directly at this charge pile, but also very careful attention to the, the equipotential bonding around this. And it's not real obvious, this is a big concrete buttress, the, the pile right there, the footer, but there, there's a, a great concern that the designers pay attention to that and put equipotential bonding in place. So that's an interesting look at that, that question. Why do you need it? So the air terminals, we're just gonna you know, keep walking through the requirements of, of the, the pillars. You have air terminals. You place air terminals over the target area and you give the lightning a preferred attachment point. It may still strike something you don't want, but you've, you're beating the odds. And so what's nice about this photograph, it gives you, this illustration gives you a nice show of that rolling sphere coverage. That's the, the often called the you know, tent or canopy looking coverage, but that's, that separates the, the exposed zones from the actual protected lightning protection zone under this area. And if properly treated, earthing requirements are maintained, you actually have a very safe, working environment under this protection zone. And it prevents lightning strikes directly into the exposed drivers. And this is a nice illustration. It's a little busier than you'd see at a charging station, but it gives you a good, a, a good illustration of the point. The lightning system is designed with air terminals placed with down conductors connecting the air terminal system and an earthing grid into the soil and it's the completed design creates a system of protection and you can use combinations of freestanding rods the light poles around the structures light uh, air terminals attached to the sides and and uh, exposed rooftop elements but this is a nice illustration of how that system comes together taking that same design you roll the rolling sphere over it and it gives you that illustration of the protection zones so you have exposed lightning zone zero which is zero a you're not you're not protected versus covered by lpz zero b which is covered under the lightning protection zone and then furthermore indoors you can become even more uh, protection methods and this is what happens when you ignore parts of separation distance. And then you suffer effects of, say, flashover and some fire. Now, granted, this may not be a good example for a charging station, but you can see the similar effects of flashover. And this is what you're trying to guard against. At one point, maybe a lightning protection system is installed. There's the down conductor. But Later, somebody comes in and installs security cameras or other lighting fixtures or other sensors or a radio, uh, Wi-Fi radios and such on the sides of buildings that, or other apparatus, and it's too close to the lightning protection system. So you either bond it or you separate it. And this is an example of it not being separate. So we're going to talk more about earthing. So I'd like to get a, a quick look at the earthing. How far apart should earth rods be placed? This is actually a fairly common question. Uh, much depends on the state of the 
the area, you, you do get weird things like buried cars and huge rocks. So there's there's much to be said for the state of the soil that you're that you're at. But when you're designing it and in best practice, how far apart? Depth of rod, the, just a rule of thumb 20 feet, rule of thumb six meters, or even less than 20 feet. What's the suggested spacing? And we have a consensus between the depth of the rod and six meters. And so they're, they're all roughly, at the depth of the rod equals a space apart is very common. I've seen that used. Uh, also 20 feet, six meters, same, just about. Uh, less than 20 feet, I mean, it's it's permissible, but what happens is the rods, when they get too close together, they actually influence each other. So when while one rod's trying to dis displace charge, the other rod is also trying to displace charge, and they they can't, you know, they, you're you're losing the effectiveness of the earth rods if they're too close together. So when faced with the aspect of adding rods, you have to move them apart. So that's a really good rule of thumb. Okay, so we'll move to the next slide and talk more about designing. These are just great uh, descriptions of type A, which is a isolated earth rod that basically comes off of a down conductor and goes to earth. And as long as you have adequate contact with the soil, either a horizontal radial or a buried earth rod, as long as you have adequate contact, you achieve a suitable earth contact for that down conductor. The other very popular method you will see is something that looks more like the ring, either embedded in the foundation or in the footer, but it looks more like a buried ring to achieve the required contact with the soil. So these are two very you know, common methods to get this to, to achieve earthing. So here's a question for the users. How often do you encounter grounding and bonding issues? Are is this is this a real common problem that you're seeing a couple of times? Is it more than a couple of times a year? And is it even more than 10 times per year? Are you getting a lot of grounding and bonding issues? So let's see the audience experience. Give them a moment to reply. Thank you. couple of times a year, up to 10, which is, you know, quite a bit. And then a few people get a lot. And I'm down here in Florida and we're already getting lightning seasons already started. So if I have grounding and bonding issues, it will quickly show up. Uh, you know, lose, I'll lose my electric power. I'll lose my Wi-Fi if I'm not careful. Um, but I apply SPDs at my home. So I, I, I'm fairly confident <clears throat> personally. So it's un it's good to understand that the how how big of a problem that this is perceived to be. So earlier we talked about the severity of the lightning class. If you have high risk, you can apply a higher class of lightning protection, which in basically in involves more lightning rods, but it also involves more contact with the soil. And so that's what uh, is is also driven by the the IEC standard gives you a, a really good method to derive your soil uh, design your earthing design based on soil resistivity and based on the length of conductor you are obligated to have buried in the soil and where much like a NFPA system corresponds very closely with it, class three but we have allowances for a higher class two and higher class one with more contact with the soil. And that's really what's driven by the, the control of and evaluation. You evaluate your risk, design and implement measures. Okay, separation. From what type of equipment should down conductor separation be maintained? So you're putting up lightning rods. From what should you keep it separate from? The neighboring buildings, trees, the conductor parts around you, roof mounted structures or interior structures 
you know, and by that we mean stuff maybe within the wall that you don't necessarily see. So let's see what the consensus, what our what our audience experience feels. Very, uh, con very well, the conductive parts, and that's that's actually about the closest best answer. Anything that's conductive either is bonded or separate. Uh, neighboring buildings, that all, the, many of this stuff falls. You know, that for a charging station, you definitely need to be worried about your conductive parts. Uh, interesting, good, good feedback. Thank you, audience. So. Separation distance is calculated thusly in uh, the IEC standard, where the lightning current is actually uh, a factor in the uh, separation distance applied, but uh, the height of the building, the lightning current, and then the, the spacing. So one of the interesting alignments with the NFPA and IEC standards is the bonding distance calculation of NFPA gives you very high agreement with the separation calculation of IEC. The standards are reasonably aligned so that when you're designing for a separation distance, the bonding calculation gives you a very close answer as well. Just a very, very good alignment between standards. Uh, it's interesting to note the IEC methods allow the higher class level, which will affect the spacing, this separation distance. So if you're injecting a higher lightning current, you need more and more space. Now this illustration, this photograph may not be at a very common charging station, but it's a great illustration of, of misuse of separation distance. Very much like that lightning, that light post next to the charging pile, where you wanna maintain either enough adequate space or get it bonded. And in this case, the designers went to a lot of trouble to, to put up a lightning air terminal, but they placed it too close to conductive parts around it. That's a, a, a failure of the separation calculation. So earthing, equipotential bonding. This has been a very uh, prevalent piece of our discussion today because this is very much the customer experience at a charging station. And the control of touch step voltage becomes a very uh, important aspect of the design. And that comes down to good equipotential bonding. And what we find a lot in, in buried rebar, in footers and, and in buried rebar is the, the standard sort of methods of maybe putting on twist ties, that's not really a lightning rated connection. So when you're, when you're injecting lightning currents in a, a what I like to call a casual connection is not the same as an equipotential bonded connection for the purpose of control of that touch step voltage. So what you find is inadequate bonds can actually create little arky sparky buried in the concrete. And over time it will uh, even cause failure of the concrete, but uh, for the purpose of touch step voltage, you're not achieving your goal. So it's important to, to really pay attention to all of that interstitial bonding. So now we've got to look at the whole, the whole aspects. What, what will it look like when you pay attention to all of the aspects? You'll see air terminals, you'll see dedicated down conductors that are adequately spaced from other apparatus. You'll see application of surge protection devices on both power and data lines. You'll see application of surge protection devices at the main service inter disconnects of the structures and buildings, at the point of use at the charging stations. And you won't see, but you can depend on them, is the buried interconnected earthing system to reduce voltage, uh, touch that voltage rises and to adequately control both the safe electrical operation, the, the 60 hertz and you know DC charging operation, but also the effects of lightning voltage, touch step voltage incidents. 
So what does the surge protection provide? What is it doing? Is it providing equipotential bonding for electrical wires? Is it providing a voltage control between wires to ground? Is it the surge current path to ground? Is it voltage relief during transient events? Is it no value if it's not installed? Now I'm my my sales director makes me throw that one in because that's a, that's the greedy salesman sort of answer. But these are all I would like to see what the customers think. So a surge current path to ground is a is a comp, is a very uh, popular answer. It's, that's that is what's achieved with the equipotential bonding of the electrical wires to ground. So you're basically giving it a path to earth that you otherwise can't simply bond. And so if the voltage rises high enough, the, the surge protection device diverts current, surge current to earth. So it's doing a lot of, a lot of each of the, the aspects, depending on what your sort of method but it's actually a lot of everything in this. In uh, all the answers are somewhat similar and 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 also correct. So it's interesting to see the audience participation part of this. And of course, my greedy salesman answered, "No value if it's not installed." So thank you for that because that's it, it's it's true. No value at all. In fact, you're not meeting the standards if you're not installing your surge protection devices. So you haven't actually completed the protection measures for life and safety. So here's a good couple of illustrations on the the comprehensive system. You can see some of the aspects. You've got you've got in this case an isolated air terminal that provides earthing well away from the uh, the user experience where the 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 charging apparatus are well away from the earthing connection. You've got the buried interconnected earth rod to reduce touch step voltage for maximum safety. You've got interconnected earthing for all of your electrical operation, but also electrical uh, electrical bonding and lightning bonding rated equipment, um, a combination of you know materials that are that do not cause galvanic corrosion and losses. It's important to pay attention to all those aspects. Here you can see that you've actually got what would be expensive critical solar panels across the roof of this structure as well. So here you've got the entire set of, of the asset protected. Here's another look at a, a similar even type of structure without the solar panel awning. And, and it, here you can see it'd be even more important to have air terminals to lift up the zone of coverage over these over the driver experience so that you don't leave these people sort of on their own out in the middle of a lightning storm. In a charging situation where they're they're very much tethered to that charger, whether or not there's lightning or not, they need to get their charge so they can move on to the to the next uh, destination. So this is this is an interesting look at the the problem and really you know paying attention to each aspect. And just a few more slides to talk about surge protection application. In this case, you know, it might be part of an of an overhanging light apparatus where you can fit in a, an SPD into the light pole, and that gives you that point of use electrical surge protection. There's uh, a good look at a. This was uh, observed at a commercial parking lot. It was a brewery. I'm not ashamed to admit, but. The, by the way, they were very cognizant of their market space and they wanted to make sure that their electric vehicle customers could charge while they were enjoying their brewery experience. But notice how many SPDs do you think you need based on this photo of what you can see? And even a rough count gets you to a lot, uh, the number six or not enough, you need more SPDs. That's not even enough. So see what the audience thinks. Again, take a moment to look at the picture one more time, maybe count through it yourself, like here and there, and that's probably got a photovoltaic, and this is a charge pile, and that's another charge pile. Uh, 
the charge piles look like this. So where, you know, so take an estimate. Uh, and Stephen will push us over and the polling says, uh, give everybody a moment to decide what answer they like. And by the way, six was just my gross estimate. So if you've picked that, um, let's see the, we've got a lot. Yes. Yay. That's what I like to hear. There's going to be a lot. Actually, six is just a rough number. There may be a security camera. That would be seven. There might be lights in the background, maybe even more. That would be eight. But you can see that at the point of use for the solar panels, for the lights, you would need to apply surge protection devices. So it's a really good understanding to see what the audience is thinking about and getting us all you know, concerned about the, the, the safe experience for the charging customers. And you know we really want to uh, make sure that customers are, are and designers are paying attention early on at design concept time. What can I do to provide the safest, most efficient experience for the chart the the drivers? And think of it from that standpoint. You're the driver of that electric vehicle. You pull up. You want a safe experience. You you want to see security cameras. You want to see a robust. Uh, and safe electrical environment. So there's there's definitely a, a an aspect to the whole market space that you think of it from yourself. What do you want to experience? And so put that put that insight into your own design uh, sort of philosophy. So uh, really good alignment in the electrical vehicle charging standard. Any uh, National Electric Code aligns up with uh, the same sets of suggestions we've seen here from the IEC methods. Uh, protection products listed for the purpose. Overcurrent protection rated to 125% of a rated load. Uh, echo potential bonding must be maintained. This is said very, very same things we apply from the pillars of lightning protection. And here, just a quick look. This is your charging apparatus at your at something like a home or residential, and uh, you you can see that you've got to apply the same sorts of measures. So I wanted to give a few moments still for questions. Uh, what we covered today, just a quick look at the content that we looked at, and. Here's a just a snapshot again of the credit application. If you are interested in this, then to, to let us know, and we can provide cert certificates, uh, and or you can apply the, with these uh, provider number and license number. Really appreciate that. So, Stephen, I'm not sure it's uh, we got about five minutes. If there's questions from our audience today. Hi, Mark. Yes, we received. Two questions um, up to now, and um, if more questions come in and there's enough time, we can address them. Otherwise, otherwise, sure. just uh, send them to us and we'll reply to them by email. So the first question, if all the charging posts, I think this refers back to that uh, ground potential rise gradient that you showed. Mm -hmm. all the yes, different on. Potential yes. Posts. yes. Um, if all the charging posts are bonded to the ground and the GPR gradient causes that difference in the local ground connections, um, are you saying SPDs is necessary at each and every pole as each will be at a different line to ground potential or only the main AC power feed? Well, it's the, by, by way of using the standard, it would be all of the above. So even if you've attached all of this charge poles into a into like a really nice mesh grid, like some of the illustrations of like parking spaces and stuff. When you do that, you still apply SPDs at the point of use and at the main, what's considered the main AC feed. And, and the purpose for that is the control of the surge and voltage events directly at the point of use, especially in this charging environment where what's coming from your charging pile is going into somebody else's automobile, into their property. So, you know, there really is a, is a concern that what you deliver to the customer is the best quality, you know, charging experience you can. So, 
you know, break it down the, you know, in, in as you see fit, but there's there's a great argument for coordinated electrical surge protection at the main and at the apparatus. Stephen, if there's any comments that you want to add about distances, uh, no, 10, that 10 meters good. apart is the rule of thumb be between adding SPDs. No, that sounds good. You, I think you adequate, adequately answered the question, Mark. Um, then is a request or a, a question, please explain why some chargers need type 1 SPDs and others need type 2. Um, he's referring to a slide where you had a structure with a lightning protection system closer to some chargers that you installed type 2 SPDs in. And, and he's asking why type two's there and then type one's at the ones that are further away. I'm, I'm not sure if, I, if I'd uh, read that slide correctly. We may, we may wanna take this one back and actually talk about the slide separately offline because it's a little awkward, but the- If you the, could uh, maybe just go to that slide real quick um, that shows, that shows that system. We had, we had this. Yep, that's the slide. This yes. was a similar system. So this, in in this particular slide, what we're showing is the type one SPD is where it's subject to a ground potential rise. That's that's the main lightning uh, type event for it that's described by an IEC type one uh, protector is the the direct strike ten by three fifty withstand. In this illustration, we're showing that 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 uh, that power line is actually not connected to the down conductor. So don't that illustration might be a little little awkward right there in the in the illustration at the corner right there at the the building. That's not actually a connection to the down conductor. So don't be fooled by that. But the application of that type two protector is right at the charging apparatus that's already protected by the same mains. And then when you're far out in the parking lot, you're actually not under a zone of protection out by these cars to the right. So they're then subject to a direct strike event out here. So when you're, when you're covered by your zone of protection, it's only at your service. When you're not covered with the zone of protection, you're more exposed. And so each of these is a type one. Perfect. I think that's all okay. we have time for. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Well, thank you, audience today, Stephen. Thank you for your the the background support. It's a it's a really exciting uh, way for us to present our uh, topics to the industry. Appreciate any feedback, and thanks for your participation today.